Hello YouTube. I hope you guys are doing well. I am so sorry that this video took so long to come out. Life has been pretty hectic. Uh, it's been good, but hectic. I uh, will get to that in a bit. But continuing on from where we left off in term one. So in my previous video, I went through all the work that I did in term one. And a lot of that was just art fundamentals of like art execution itself. Moving on into term two, the focus was more on design values. And they kind of drilled into our brains that in the concept art industry, the value and the money isn't in, you know, painting, just painting pretty pictures it's in the design solution and your design ideation. That's what people are paying for. So, you know, we also had to kind of optimize our workflow from the initial sketching to 3D, going back into 2D and doing paint over. And then at the end, you know, how are you gonna present and pitch your idea to your client? Because we had kind of longer projects in term two compared to term one, um, we had time to kind of run through that entire work process. Also, in term two, I started tattooing and that's why I kind of struggled to manage my time throughout term two a little bit. But I also learned how to, you know, pick up skills from both sides. I think my line art improved in concept art because of what I was doing in tattooing. So I think it's really good to branch out and learn about different mediums and how other people work because it will also help inform you know the main thing that you're doing yeah so jumping into term two our first subject was so in visual communications two, the objective was kind of how to draw things for production use in like the normal pipeline right you have concept art that is created in the beginning those very like moody atmospheric uh, cinematic shots to pitch your initial idea to you know the producers of the client and then once the IP gets approved you go into pre-production where we do these kind of three-quarter cutaway camera angle views where you can see the whole design from different angles and um, you know have orthographic views have labeling call outs um, to give information to 3d artists animators everyone down the pipeline so that was the purpose of like the production type of shots that we were doing in this class so the first assignment that we had was the teenage bedroom um i think it was kind of starting us off with a smaller environment like just one room and how to create like a condensed environment of entertainment i think feng always said it was better to have a small world that feels big than a big world that feels small and empty right so this is kind of the idea of having a very small space but it has lots of like interesting things to look at and experience so we kind of just had to pick a time period and a hobby for this teenager I picked kind of like the late 80s, early 90s, like hip hop era. Yeah, this guy who's like really into hip hop culture. So I started off with exploration sketches of the the architecture and the layout itself, playing with like the XYZ axes, adding like balconies. Um, you know how in like New York they have those um, brick apartments with like the really iconic balconies? Maybe having this like thing under the staircase jutting out to create more interest in the space um yeah this is just my brainstorming like Feng really made it clear to be precise of when uh, your time period because if you're going to be you know putting like a commodore 64 or like some atari thing like it has to all the electronics and the inventions of that time have to be like historically accurate because people can like pick up on that stuff uh yeah we had to do a lot of research and i personally like doing a mind map first. I have a lot of ideas and I just want to like word vomit them. Yeah, getting all these keywords out there that will inform me when I'm trying to look for visual referencing. And then I kind of make these lists, space architecture and like the kind of IKEA furniture, just stuff that that person needs to exist in that space. And then I have another list of more unique items for set dressing. So that I just don't spend like five hours looking for image references. I actually have a list of things that I am specifically looking for. After that, I do kind of a quick sketch of where I want everything to be, like where the main focal point is. So I have this graffiti area as a main focal point and then I'll lead your eye to like this little nook where he has his turntables and stuff. So I kind of just lay out the proportions and where I, I roughly want the set dressing to look like. And then I go into 3D and I build it. 
after doing the 3D, I did a paint over. So you can see that like these shots look kind of more isometric, um, which is not good. Like it. So what I learned from this, from Fang's feedback, is isometric perspective doesn't occur in the real world. Like when we look at things, the perspective lines are always meant to converge to a vanishing point. So if your stuff looks very isometric, it one doesn't look realistic, and two, it's difficult to see the distance between objects when they're you know when they're overlapping like if there's a bed here and there's a table there it's difficult to define the depth of that so if it's a little more you know a three-point perspective is more defined you get to see like all the pathing of this space and how objects are placed within the space more yeah so that was like a huge thing that I learned in this one yeah this was really fun to do because it was such a small environment so you could just go ham and like Put different things in there uh, they also stressed you know not aligning objects you know everything is kind of not on a 90 degree angle to make it look more lived in and organic if my keyboard if my keyboard is like here i wouldn't place it you know facing the wall because that just doesn't make sense i would kind of have it angled towards where i would be sitting like this so it's kind of just that like common sense and logic that we i mean it seems easy but when you think about it you actually have to go through every object and like think about how how is this person going to be using it in the real world so that was really fun though the next one that we did was this world of warcraft rpg store it could be anything it would be like a general store or like a pet store i decided to do like this steampunk i don't know if you guys know but there are like these chinese medicine stores in asia where you go in and you get like it's kind of like an apothecary slash herbalist type thing. Uh, these are some of my interior sketches and I kind of always have a list of keywords on the side that help me just keep focused onto what mood or what vibe that I'm going for. Hearthstone vibes. Yeah, I was going for a kind of really cozy tavernish type of situation. Uh, so we had to do the RPG store and then we had to do the living quarters of the NPC guy that would be running the store. So these are some sketches of what that might be like. Um, yeah, and this is this is the thing that I came up with. It's kind of like this floating herbalist shop with uh, a really big pot in the middle in which they made these herbal remedies and you know after you go out on a long quest you could come back and replenish your health and like get buffs or whatever uh, I took a lot of inspiration from Treasure Planet which is one of my favorite movies it is I feel like it's so criminally underrated yeah it's like kind of that steampunk flying ship vibe uh, the one thing that I really I'm like kicking myself about all the time is my use of soft brush so I would always use a lot of soft brush for lights and you know that's not actually how light is seen like it's not actually as soft as this so I think yeah the use of my color dodge and soft brush control wasn't that good um, throughout term two you, you'll see that throughout my other work as well um, yeah that was kind of something that uh, really bugs me about all my work <laughs> same thing here this is his living quarters with his flying ship where he like he goes out on adventures to get his herbs and they also made us always put in like some storytelling elements to if the player is there what kind of things could initiate a quest so there might be this glowing herb that is some sort of like magical item that someone can pick up and use yeah i was thinking he could be some sort of a steampunk cyborg guy next up was another rpg store thing and i chose an middle eastern alchemy lab um because islamic alchemy was this huge thing and there's lots of like research about it but i didn't really like the way this turned out because at the time okay firstly because i fucking went ham on the soft brush again like i literally didn't know how to use a color dodge layer and i just don't know why i kept using it another thing was kind of using these photo real textures like it's okay to use photo real textures but it kind of looks too 3D, like I didn't really understand how to paint over things from Blender and make them look less uh, 3D looking. You know, I'm kind of like eh about this one, but it was really fun to research about this. I learned a lot, like, like I think this thing is called like an Alembic or something. There's lots of really cool equipment that they used to use um, 
for alchemy. Oh my god. <laughs> this one was supposed to be a throne room. I th and I remember my file crashed a few hours before I had to submit this. So that kind of stuff happens, right? And you just kind of have to, you know, do your best with what you got. So this was also like an Asian inspired this is Empress of the White Tiger. Yeah, I was looking at a lot of like Chinese kind of uh, throne room. And the point of the throne room was kind of to showcase like a very strong singular focal point. And we had to pick an animal um, that relates to, uh, to use as like their royal sigil kind of thing. So I want to do this very like feminine, celestial type of uh, throne room. But it didn't really turn out the way I wanted it to turn out. <laughs> And it's like super pixelated because, uh, I don't know, something went wrong with the export and I had to like, the lines are like super inconsistent. Yeah, this is kind of a big fail, but yeah, lesson learned. I guess like now I'm updating all my stuff onto the cloud whenever, whenever I do a project, but back then I wasn't like paying for any like cloud or I didn't even have like a hard disk to back up my work. So back up your work and then we did this other really interesting project called uh, the long voyage because everything before was was based off of like real architecture whereas this this assignment was teaching us how to you know set dress and interior design a space that wasn't conventional like uh, a vehicle like some people did boats some people did blimps or like planes so it had to be some sort of like transportation that someone would live in for a prolonged period of time. Uh, I kind of looked into like Cthulhu and that very Lovecraftian type of uh, genre. And so this was a captain's quarter, so it has some like, yeah, Cthulhu items. I don't know what's going on here. There seem like dead mermaids on the side. But I think one of the things I was struggling with uh, during the entirety of my FZD career was uh, learning how to control saturation. So I would be using like global gradient and shadows that had way too much neutral gray in them and then we'll kind of like muddy out the colors at the end and so when you see this it looks desaturated. Yeah, same thing with this. There's a lot of like neutral grays which isn't great but uh, this next one was kind of, uh, was a Hong Kong fruit market. So we had to kind of do like a, a store or like a living place where like a normal person would be would be you know, living their life and then they would have this like alter ego in the back um, like a secret lair or something I chose a subject matter that I was like I had knowledge in which is like Hong Kong because I'm born and raised in Hong Kong there's this area where they have these fruit markets in Hong Kong and they're really really old but I feel like it encapsulates a lot of iconic um, iconic things about old Hong Kong that I really love personally so you know the old taxis and these types of lights that they use in the markets that had these uh, storytelling elements like they would you know take the fruit stickers and stick them onto the fridge doors and stuff like that and then at the back i kind of tried to do this hong kong mafia hideout like because back in the 90s they would they would sell like counterfeit cds and like use them to like buy drugs and there would be like a whole drug trade like it's very reminiscent of those 90s Hong Kong cop movies. I still didn't have much control over my color dodge. Oh yeah, for this one I also learned a lot about uh, aging and creating more imperfections. So when you just kind of bring stuff out of Blender and there's no paint over or the draw uh, and the draw over is very minimal, you don't get these kind of like imperfections like or oh, where the tiles have come off off the ground or you know this wood is chipping off like. Um, it's like leaves and rats and like rusting on the corrugated iron. We also had to do props that supported that story as well. So I did this old motorcycle with these agates, which is very honky. And back then they used like watermelon knives to fight each other, <laughs> like the mafia back then in Hong Kong. So that was kind of funny. But yeah, that was my last project in visual communications. So in design assembly, we had a range of different types of design projects. Some of them were like character things, some of them were like vehicle designs. And the first one that we did was a traveling merchant. We had to pick a time period, an occupation, 
and a culture so I picked like the Edo period and back then like okay it's, it was like a bit after the Edo period where there, there used to be like female samurais but all these female samurais kind of kind of got fucked by the patriarchy and got like sent out of their like positions and so a lot of them actually started training like in secret and they use like this weapon called the naginata i think the same thing as before they had to have like a day job and then like the secret night job i wanted to have this woman that's kind of just disguising as a samurai dude selling her samurai wares and like katanas but um, at night it transforms into this training ground for other female warriors to learn like self-defense Oh, yeah, this is a weapon I was talking about um, There were it, like it's historically there was actually like a person like that. I forgot her name though I feel like I did a bit too much thinking about how this vehicle would operate that like the painting job at the end wasn't amazing like I could have added way more um, detail and like sharpness to a lot of uh, the color wash yeah that's what it ended up looking like so yeah it was just this kind of traveling training ground i think a big thing that uh kingston was talking about in fcd was differentiating between left brain tasks and right brain tasks and not not getting them mixed up because research and design ideation all that stuff is like left brain activities where you use your logic and your common sense it actually uses up a lot of your energy so everyone only has 24 hours in a day, you know, doing all my research first and getting that out of the way and then using my right brain to do all the art execution. You can kind of not think as much, it's just physically tedious to be like lining everything and painting everything, but you can, you know, just put on your music, listen to a podcast, but if there isn't enough, you know, design resolution and there are still big design flaws when you're entering that art execution phase that creates kind of hiccups in your workflow that will eventually you know eat up into the time before the deadline i hope that makes sense i don't know if that makes sense this this project was a hybrid animal we just had to find two animals and like merge them together so i picked kind of like a deer um, with antlers and a crocodile and i wanted to meld that idea with their habitat they might be living in like a, an area with lots of mangroves so when they go underwater their antlers can kind of camouflage them you know have a symbiotic relationship with a lot of the other creatures like birds and stuff that would perch on their antlers and eat the, the moss or whatever that's on them these are just some variations what do they feed on so just having these labeling things yeah, just a shot of like their habitat. These are some failed ones that like rejected designs. When I'm showing you stuff, there's actually a lot of stuff that has been rejected um, in the feedback period. So I just wanted to show this one because it's really funny. I really like this hooting bin bandit, an owl and raccoon collab. And then this one is a, a koi fish and a frog. I kind of thought about like this proportion and the weight his head would have and how it would just not be able to jump and just topple over. <laughs> yeah, we also had to design this sidekick. So I did this Aussie platypus dude. My idea was that he was like Ned Kelly's sidekick or something. <laughs> yeah, the stuff that he'd be carrying around with him. This was... I think this is considered fan art to a point. I really like Bard from League of Legends. I just think his character is so cool and adorable. So I wanted to do kind of a resting shrine. He also has this little poro snack that he's eating and the meeps are hanging out outside. This soft brush is still a problem. You can see that it's like you're in a fucking womb or something. <laughs> it doesn't look like there's any edge control or hardness to the, the, the rocks and the surfaces. I don't know if you guys have played this really old RPG called Dungeons and Dragons Online. It like the graphics are kind of shitty but it's a really good game. <laughs> yeah this kind of resting shrine area was based off of that. This next assignment was an exomech suit and they had to be kind of a like police firefighter or some like military like part of this civilian rescue that's what it was. I did the Republic of Korea Air Force Stealth Reconnaissance EMP Specialist. It's just like this mech suit thing, there's like an HED display helmet and you know some homing missiles that come out of her calves. <laughs> oh yeah, she can like disrupt enemy communications. I think one thing I also really learned about uh, with this was just having 
uh, a texture on the highlights. This one was a vehicle and a character. I obviously took a lot of inspiration from Mad Max universe and I had a lot of fun doing like the aging, making it look really old and gross and beat up. Like a bike, biker gang of girls who, you know, this is like their home base, like their traveling home base. And whenever people would come and like they, um, disrupt them, they could just hop on these bikes and they would just like detach from this old diesel thing. Yeah, I, I started off sketching up the orthographic views before modeling it in Blender. But we had to do a character, so this was like their mother, like their leader. And I think she's super badass. I want to do an older lady, but still show that she has that like gusto and, you know, robustness to her. I really, really enjoyed this subject. I think there's a good variety of different types of things that we could experiment with. So yeah, moving on. As I mentioned before in visual communications too, all of our work was geared toward three-quarter cutaway view of environments. Whereas in this class, it was more about like the cinematic shot. You had to really think about the composition, so foreground, midground, background kind of stuff, like an establishing shot. So it's not just defined to like rooms anymore, it's a lot of exterior kind of shots. Um, I really really struggled with this class so we started off with them giving us a 3d model of this gothic church and then we had to find like a good camera angle everything that we had to do had to be from like a human point of view field of view yeah, so we had to find a camera angle and then sketch in things in the foreground midground and background to to communicate a story um, yeah it was a good learning experience just drawing over stuff yeah we did that oh they also gave us another environment so we were just doing a lot of these to get used to finding a good camera angle so yeah we did some of them um, with line work and gray wash we also went back to the teenage bedroom that we did in uh, viscom we had to find certain angles and like do gray wash paint over um also learn about contrast how to make it look more impactful on the first read <laughs> again i was using a lot of soft brush that just made everything look like this mushy type of texture i kind of only troubleshooted that after fzd this one was really fun um i did this based off of like a fallout kind of situation so it had to be this like post-apocalyptic environment and um I just really like the atom punk genre with uh, like the old type of diners and the architecture that they used to use, like the old blasters and um, retro cars and stuff like that. I even added like Vault 88 to this. I think I could have pushed the contrast in this a lot more as well to make, you know, have the background recede a lot more and have things pop out. Doing an interior cinematic shot. Yeah, same thing. I was also using a lot of neutral grey. You guys can see like kind of like the bad habits that I picked up as well throughout the term. Once you get into a certain workflow, sometimes you get stuck into that and then you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's good to like have a step back and like look at how you're doing things and how you can improve. That was visual development. That was pretty much all the work we did in term two at FCD. I got some comments. Um, on my term one video asking me what are you up to now after FZD is over? I actually just fell into this spiral existential crisis I think a lot of us did because after you know pulling a thousand all-nighters and people just telling you to do things all the time and then suddenly no one's giving you all these instructions it's kind of like a shock like okay I was freelancing for a while um, doing like random freelance concept art projects and tattooing part-time but that was very stressful for me financially because you know I never knew when my next paycheck was coming in and the rent in Singapore is like fucking insane you know freelancing and tattooing people come in waves like projects come in in waves clients come in seasonally the majority of the people that were in my class at FZE they're still freelancing or like permalancing for a studio only like a couple of them are working a nine to five at a studio and there are pros and cons to that like uh, obviously with freelancing you can charge charge by the hour charge by the day people earn 
people can earn a lot of money doing freelancing as opposed to you know I have friends who are like getting paid peanuts working at studios the good thing about studios is that you get to learn a lot and absorb a lot of knowledge a lot of them have seniors that are really really experienced people who are taking them under their wing and they're learning a lot from them whereas like you know if you're just freelancing you're kind of working with the same workflow and knowledge that you know like all that you've known and it's um, it's kind of difficult for like improvement and growth in that aspect. If you're just graduating from art school, uh, concept art, um, or you're about to graduate, that's something to consider for sure. If I was still living at home and I didn't have to think about rent, I would definitely prioritize going for more experience because in the long run it's more beneficial. That's just my opinion. A lot of people have also been messaging me about What's going on with FZD? I don't think I'm in a place to talk about their school and what they're doing and I honestly actually have no idea. All I do know is that the the area where the previous school was in has shut down because the landlord has been taking the land back. I think they're like developing new land there or something. So um, yeah, after that, uh, Kingston actually got appointed to be the program director at another concept art school in Singapore called Majors Institute. So he actually asked me to go work there with him and assist him on the academic team. And he's also invited a lot of ex-FCD teachers to teach there as well. Yeah, I think that's really good for me too because now I finally have like a stable 9-to-5 income. And my boss at my tattoo studio has been really understanding. Like, he's uh, allowing me to go in after work hours and on the weekends to tattoo my clients. Yeah, it's been really good. And uh, with majors as well, they cover not only concept art, they also do like game art, game tech and like uh, VR kind of stuff so we're trying to integrate all that all of those aspects into the curriculums with like new technology and like new work processes so that's really exciting um, and I'm starting to learn ZBrush which is super cool because I've always wanted to learn how to sculpt in 3D I've also been trying to work on my Etsy shop and I've been doing some freelance projects on the side as well like working on some indie games and hopefully be more consistent at uh, posting on YouTube, so yeah. I think a lot of people experience that existential crisis after graduating. I'm still figuring things out, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, the more you learn about something, the more you realize there is to learn. I tried to take some online courses and um, find other resources with things that I was still struggling with at FZD. It can be kind of demoralizing, especially with social media and you know people posting their work every day and you see people being super productive or AI being this huge thing now and artwork can be generated so quick. I, I did go through like a period where I was really bogged down about that but I also watched Trent Kanuga's video about AI and he was talking about how the enjoyment of doing art itself will never really go away no matter how much AI progresses, right? That was a really big wake-up call for me to just, you know, take things at my own pace and not compare myself too much on people on, with people on social media and just realizing that loving art is a gift kind of this companion that will always be with you throughout your life and this lens you can see the world through and experience life and you know be part of a community or connect with other people and um yeah i just think that in itself is a blessing yeah also along with that you, there's like a ton of comments so in the next video in uh, of term three i'll do like a little q a at the end to try and answer a lot of like the big questions that you guys might have um yeah so stay tuned for the next one i'll see you guys on the flip side <laughs>